Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Practice Excellence Speaker Series. My name is Zubin Austin, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's session. Our presenter today is Tamlin Friedman, and she will be presenting on the CARD system for improving the vaccination experience at school, results of a small-scale implementation project on student symptoms. Tamlin will be presenting for about uh, 20 to 30 minutes, and following that, we will have our discussant for today provide initial questions and reflections. Our discussant for today's CPE speaker rounds is Dr. Rob Bonin. After Rob has had a chance to reflect on Tamlin's presentation, we will open this series up to all of you in the audience to ask your questions, offer your insights, and engage with both the speaker and the discussant about the topic being presented today. To begin with, let me introduce Tamlin. Tamlin Friedman is a recent Master of Science graduate of the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Toronto. At the age of three, she had an aversive experience getting a vaccine, which led to a deep fear of needles for the entirety of her childhood. It was a natural progression for her then to pursue research opportunities, exploring the ways to improve the school vaccination experience for youth. Under the supervision of Professor Anna Taddeo here at the faculty, her MSc project examined the impact of the CARD, or Comfort, Ask, Relax, Distract, system, which was adapted from a clinical practice guideline to help mitigate vaccine fear, pain, and dizziness in children. Please join me in welcoming Tamlin. Thanks so much, Zubin. Um, I'm going to get started now. I don't know if what I see, though, is um, what everyone else sees, which is the control panel in the middle of my screen. And I was wondering if, if that is the case or not. Do you see that, Stephen? Nope, we see, uh, what we're seeing is actually your PowerPoint slide and then just along the bottom of the usual sort of menu bar, but it's okay. it works perfectly fine. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so yes, uh, my project was, called, was about the card system uh, to improve the vaccination experience at school. Um, and so just to start off, just to start off um, with some background, uh, school vaccines play a significant role in the prevention and control of infectious diseases in children. Um, however, currently vaccine education in schools primarily focuses on information about the diseases and the vaccines to protect against those diseases, but rarely addresses needle pain and fear, which is critical for students as many of them have concerns about pain, dizziness, and fear of needles, which can result in fainting, distress, and even vaccine refusal. So um, a group of interdisciplinary scientists across Canada came together to develop a clinical practice guideline to provide recommendations of evidence-based strategies to actually mitigate these fear, pain, and fainting during vaccinations. However, strategies from the clinical practice guideline are rarely implemented in clinical settings, and the CPG did not address the school vaccination setting due to a gap in the literature. So that's where my research project came in. We wanted to adapt the clinical practice guideline for the school vaccination context. And we addressed this gap using the knowledge to action cycle and uh, the consolidated framework for implementation research. So just to kind of give an overview, the project had three phases. And so in the first phase, we were um, conducting focus groups with key stakeholders such as nurses, children, parents, um, and school staff. And then we analyzed you know, their feedback as to the um, barriers and facilitators to a positive school vaccination experience. And then um, in the second phase, we developed interventions, which is the card system, which I'll touch on shortly. And then the third phase, which was my actual uh, research project, was implementing CARD and evaluating um, its outcomes. So what exactly is CARD? So CARD stands for Comfort, Ask, Relax, Distract. And CARD has two functions. 
it's a framework for planning and conducting the vaccination clinics and informing the necessary accommodations that uh, have to be made for um, the optimal school vaccination experience as well. CARD is an acronym and a coping strategy for the children to use, and it infuses these evidence-based um, strategies for the school vaccination context. So what exactly does CARD look like? Well, as you can see here, um, this is a handout that was given in the vaccine education session by the school nurse. And we're gonna just go through what exactly um, a child would hypothetically fill out for their, their sheet to use on vaccination day. So Sally here um, wants to listen to music and sing um, to keep her mind off the needle. Um, she'll ask the nurse to encourage her to take deep belly breaths. She also wants to have her friend Taylor with her. So, um, on the day of the vaccine, um, Taylor will be um, sent down with, with Sally to, to get their vaccines together. So Taylor can be a support system for Sally. And she'd also like it done in a private room. She's gonna keep her arm loose and she's going to wear a short sleeve shirt to maximize her comfort. So uh, Sally wrote all of these things down then the school nurse collects it after the, the vaccine education lesson's over. And then on the day of the clinic, um, or sorry, prior to the clinic, all of these um, strategies are documented by the school nurse. And then um, basically the school nurse acts like a genie and grants all of Sally's wishes on the day of the vaccine, making sure that, you know, the, the nurse will remind Sally, oh, you wanted to sing, what do you wanna sing? That kind of thing, take deep breaths, Taylor will be there, it'll happen in a private room. Um, she'll encourage Sally to you know, keep her arm loose and hopefully she remembered to wear a t-shirt. There's not really much you can do if uh, she's not, but <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that's, that's what um, the card um, pamphlet looks like and all the children, um, as part of the study filled one of these out and we accommodated their requests. So um, the methods. So um, the, just an overview, we had a controlled clinical trial with parallel clusters um, with an intervention um, cluster who received CARD and then um, the control schools which um, had the typical standard of care. Um, the population was uh, grade seven students who were eligible for school vaccinations. Um, this took place in um, Niagara region with uh, 10 schools that were served by Niagara region public health and five schools um, were considered the intervention card schools and there were five control schools for um, the round one and round two vaccination clinics, which took place in the fall and spring, respectively. So the outcomes that we were interested in looking at were student symptoms, so fear, pain, and dizziness, as well as uh, knowledge on coping strategies in the CARD schools, as well as fidelity um, to implementing CARD. So um, just another note on blinding, so all blinded to the hypothesis. Um, card nurses and others providing the card intervention were not blinded um, as they were given training on how to effectively uh, use the card system. And um, there was a, a minimization of contamination between groups um, as nurses were either um, instructed to provide care to the um, intervention schools or the control schools, but there was no overlap. So they, and um, the card schools were in a separate region of Niagara region um, from the control schools. So um, what exactly was unique to the intervention schools? Um, there were modified uh, nurse checklists to prepare for the school year. 
Um, the vaccine education lesson was as well modified um, and incorporated the um, evidence-based strategies from the clinical practice guideline, as well as um, special pamphlets for students, parents, and school staff, and the how the clinics um, were facilitated was um, special for the um, for the CARD schools um, to incorporate CARD and accommodate the student preferences. As well, typically in Niagara region, uh, the school nurse only attends uh, the first round of school clinics. Um, however, at the CARD schools, um, the school nurse was present for both round one and round two. So um, this is just an overview of all of the interventions that we incorporated for the CARD schools. Um, and so, as you can see, there were plenty of things. And so there is plenty to, uh, to take into consideration with respect to fidelity. Um, so my research questions, my primary research question was, is the CARD system effective in reducing pain, fear, and dizziness in students receiving vaccinations at school compared to the standard care procedures? And my secondary questions were, does the CARD system increase knowledge about effective coping interventions and what, the, what is the fidelity of implementing CARD? So um, looking at the student experience, students rated their levels of fear, pain, and dizziness uh, during the vaccination experience. And so um, they did this after they received their vaccines. And this was, um, measured using the a student feedback questionnaire with an 11 point numerical rating scale um, and so this was validated to measure pain in youth age 6 to 16 and so we applied this to measure fear and dizziness as well and um, we dichotomized this for the analysis into um, high pain fear or dizziness and not high pain fear or dizziness um, and um, to take into account some confounders, we uh, thought of um, sex as well as the number of injections received. So our second outcome that we were looking at was knowledge of um, vaccination coping strategies. So we wanted to see if um, students attending the CARD schools, you know, gained more knowledge about um, vaccination, pain, fear, and dizziness strategies from their uh, education lesson. And so we assessed this using a pre-post knowledge questionnaire. And it was um, a test with 10 yes or no questions on the effectiveness of strategies. And this questionnaire um, was developed by the study team as informed by the content of the clinical practice guidelines. So um, our third outcome was fidelity. And so we wanted to see if um, CARD was implemented as it was designed. And this just kind of breaks down all of the tasks um, that um, made up, you know, implementing CARD. And so um, I'll go through kind of the flow of the process um, shortly, but just so you can see all of the different things that we implemented. Um, but we wanted to make sure uh, how we made sure that each of the um, interventions were implemented properly. We used checklists um, and we monitored, you know, the questionnaires and took observational field notes. So um, this is just, this is the, uh, the process of how, um, of what happened in my study. So 10 schools were selected and then we had um, a total of 323 eligible students um, with five card schools, five control schools. In the education lesson, it was tailored um, to incorporate card compared to the control um, education lesson, which is the standard vaccine lesson that's given to schools all across Ontario. Um, I filled out a process checklist to um, make notes of what happened at the lesson for both the, the uh, card education lesson and control. Um, there were um, several students were excluded and that was either they did not consent 
to um, be vaccinated at that time, or they had already completed um, their vaccination series or were absent. Um, then at the clinic, um, I completed the clinic process checklist and field notes where um, I you know, took notes on what happened at the clinic. Um, there was a fidelity checklist to ensure that um, nurses were delivering card as, um, as we had anticipated to in implement it. Um, the nurse checklist also, um, uh, actually, I said what I wanted to say about that. Um, I, I closely monitored 10% of interactions between nurses and students. Um, as well, um, children filled out their student feedback questionnaire, um, rating their pain, fear, and dizziness. And um, there was also a, a question at the bottom if there was anything else that uh, they thought of to improve the vaccination experience. Um, and that was the same for book clinic in um, round one and round two. Um, and between round one and one, round two, if there were children who were excluded, it was because um, they either completed the series after round one or they were absent. So um, as you can see, um, the demographics between uh, the card and control students, um, they, there was, it was pretty similar, the number of um, male to female, the number of injections um, for both rounds as well. And so um, as you can see here, this, this table um, outlines um, coping strategies used by students in round one and round two. Um, and you'll notice that a lot of the um, the strategies that we highlighted for the um, in the card education lesson um, were widely used, and the, it was a statistically significant um, a, of a difference to incorporate things such as an external device or object, um, deep breathing, having a friend, um, and privacy. So um, with respect to the frequency of high fear, pain, and dizziness um, in students, um, we found that there was a group effect, a statistically significant group effect for fear and dizziness as it was um, lower in, in CARD students. Uh, there was no difference found um, in, with respect to pain, and there was no time effect or group times time effect. Um, and so, um, yeah, oops. Um, with respect to looking at um, knowledge from pre to post, we found that there was a statistically significant increase in score um, on their knowledge of evidence-based strategies to um, reduce fear, pain, and dizziness um, for the vaccines. And with respect to fidelity, um, there was a high degree of fidelity. Um, as you can see here, um, for most um, of the tasks evaluated, um, with respect to reviewing the case scenarios um, due to uh, children acting out and um, just some variability in, um, school day, day-to-day -day, um, concerns. Uh, we weren't able to um, get through all of the scenarios just due to those time restrictions. Um, but with respect to everything else, there was a very high degree of fidelity. There was one um, card school where um, we set up the uh, waiting area inside the clinic when it was the common protocol to set it up outside the clinic. So that um, is reflected in the, the four out of five card schools, as opposed to all five um, following proper clinic setup. Um, but other than that, overall, a uh, very high degree of fidelity. Um, so um, overall, what we found were lower levels of fear and dizziness in card students compared to control. Um, 
there was no significant difference in levels of pain. Um, and there was a significant increase in knowledge about the mitigation strategies after the education session, and there was a high degree of fidelity. So moving on to limitations and strengths. Um, um, there was a lack of randomization um, as well um, with the card nurses, um, given that they were um, educated on card, um, there could have been a possibility of performance and response bias. They could have also, when they were filling out their um, nurse feedback form, they could have um, assessed it differently based on this bias. Um, I, as the lead researcher, was not blinded, um, so I knew who was a an intervention student, who was a control student, um, and sometimes the children would ask me questions, so there could have been potential response bias in um, their questionnaire responses as well. Um, as well, uh, there was possible self-selection bias as all participants consented to school vaccination. Um, we also, in this study, did not evaluate if CARD met the needs of specific subgroups or unique needs of individuals, such as those with a developmental challenge. Um, as well, uh, the delivery of CARD was not standardized. There was no nurse dialogue template. Um, absent students who missed the vaccine education lesson had to to give a, or were given a truncated lesson and no member of the study team, um, like from the research side of things, was present to observe this. It was just um, the child and a school nurse. As well, um, we did not assess um, the optimal inter interval between the education session and vaccination and that kind of fluctuated uh, between um, schools. It was typically between two to four weeks though. So with respect to strengths, um, we had a parallel cluster design. So um, this prevented uh, contamination um, and also um, it minimized response bias as um, the, the clusters were in separate regions. Um, all students were naive to cards, so this minimized um, a response bias. And um, there was minimal attrition um, as you know, we were coming to students who attended these schools. Um, as well, um, schools were matched for demographic variables to make them more similar. So when we selected our schools, we tried to match based on school size, um, SE, socioeconomic status, um, just to try to have that representation of, you know, the variances in, you know, different schools in, in an area. Um, as well, um, there was minimal risk of contamination between nurses in the card and control schools. And this was because, um, as I mentioned before, um, nurses assigned to CART schools were not, in addition, assigned to control schools. They were given separate regions. So uh, just to sum up, um, the study shows some preliminary evidence of the effectiveness of CARD in improving the school vaccination experience. Um, future research is recommended to explore using CARD um, as an intervention for pain and fear management both in the school setting in addition to outside the school setting. And um, with that said, card resources may need to be modified to ensure that they're suitable for different contexts. And that is all. So I just wanna thank all the people involved in this project. It was, you know, couldn't have done it without um, Dr. Tadio, my supervisor, um, in addition to the greater research team, which was all of these people. So yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the presentation, Tamlin, and for giving us a, a really interesting topic to think about, because obviously pain control and vaccine hesitancy are major issues that uh, pharmacists deal with, and perhaps pharmacists will be dealing a lot more with vaccine hesitancy as things progress on the COVID front.
Yeah. I'd like to now uh, introduce our discussant for this afternoon, and that is Dr. Rob Bonin. Dr. Bonin is an assistant professor and just an all-around swell guy at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy here at the University of Toronto. He is also the Canada Research Chair in Sensory Plasticity and Reconsolidation and is a scientist at the University of Toronto Centre for the Study of Pain. I'm going to invite Rob to provide his preliminary reflections on uh, Tamlin's presentation and start by asking questions and engaging her in some interaction. In the meantime, if anybody in the audience has specific questions, observations or reflections to share, I would encourage you to start typing it using the chat function that's available on the GoToWebinar uh, site. After Rob has uh, provided his feedback, we'll be going through some of the questions in the chat function and having an opportunity to engage both Rob and Tamlin in some interaction with the audience. Let me turn it over to Rob. Thank you, Zubin. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And thank you, Tamlin, for the excellent talk. Um, you have a, clearly a nicely designed study. Um, you know, very clear uh, results there in terms of minimizing fear. I think that this is actually something as Ubin mentioned, that's very important to address a pressing problem of um, vaccine hesitancy. So this is a topic that's actually very relevant to me, not only because I have uh, two small kids and we <laughs> use these um, general approaches to try to you know, keep them calm and sure. happy during the vaccination procedure, but also because I fall into that large category of people who I would euphemistically describe as people who really dislike needles. <laughs> um, yeah. The main reason for this I would say was uh, because of a vaccination I received as a graduate student at U of T. Um, mm. And at the time I was a, still am, a basic scientist and we study preclinical models. Um, so we, I was doing at the time a lot of injections in mice using these super tiny uh, 30 gauge needles. And that was my general ex expectations of needles at the time. And I think the nurse brought out was maybe something of an 18 gauge needle. Oh gosh. Uh, nothing very large, but at the time it looked to me kind of like a sharpened flagpole. Oh my! So, <laughs> so I'm <laughs> congratulating myself after the uh, the vaccination. I got up to leave, and then next thing I found myself was lying on the doctor's bed after passing out. Oh no! So, so from this, um, I developed a fear of my I guess my response to vaccinations that I've had to overcome uh, over a number of years. And as someone who studies links between memory and pain, I find these actually very fascinating and very much linked in terms of how we have let's say traumatic or maladaptive uh, memories. So there was a great uh, pain pharmacologist neuroscientist Frank Pareko uh, at the University of Arizona who describes pain as a motivating and learning stimulus. And I think we can mm -hmm. all agree that pain can um, evoke very strong memories. Painful events yeah. tend to be remembered very very clearly. So this makes sense, right? It's a very potent uh, learning event. But in the context of vaccination, um, I'd say that the pain itself is actually quite mild, right? It's not a very painful procedure whatsoever. So there's no. it's disproportionate. You would actually expect there to be um, not much of a memory to this. So on another side, um, negative emotions are also very potent learning stimulus. So mm -hmm. fear itself of a procedure, even going through, even with something as mild as pain, can make it seem like a very dramatic or traumatic uh, event with a very strong memory afterwards. So I think that the work that you're doing to minimize that fear associated will actually have very profound effects in terms of later vaccine hesitancy, later fear for vaccination. And we see it as well, even uh, in my own kids, but even getting that sucker at the end, there was a brief period where they actually liked going to the doctors. They were excited because, you know, they get to watch a yeah. show on a phone and they get their sucker afterwards. And, they barely feel the needle. So it was actually quite a, quite a powerful way, I guess, to get over um, this hesitancy, which I think very few of us had when we were younger, a lot of these intervention approaches. Um, so I guess my first question then, um, because fear of medical procedures, as you were saying in the conclusion, is obviously not entirely restricted, uh, not at all restricted to vaccination. So do you think that this card system would actually be beneficial for other medical procedures? And if so, which ones do you think would be ideal? Sure, so um, going to the dentist, for example, lots of sharp objects, you know, in that context too, and needles uh, for freezing. Um, 
I think that that's like really uh, that one stands out to me because I don't see why you know you could you could go through card with the dentist too um, and have kind of have that in place knowing you know before the child comes in like these are the kinds of things that help the child feel um, more calm and more prepared um, to to sit in the chair. Um, in addition. Um, if a child needed to go, you know, to the hospital for for whatever reason, that in itself could be a, a pretty scary experience. You know, needle, needles galore there, but also for other um, interventions there. Um, and I think also you can you could probably use card in in non medical context too, like for taking tests if that is you know anxiety provoking. You can card really, I think, can apply to to so many um, stressful um, contexts. And I think actually um, the university did a, a feature just recently um, on Dr. Tadio applying card to to what's going on with COVID. So I think that's pretty neat. Um, so yeah, that's actually that, that's a really nice. Uh connection to um to all of these things but coming back to dentistry i didn't actually think about that that seems like an ideal uh use for this or ideal connection are these studies currently being undertaken now or is there any discussion of this um as far as i know uh not yet but i think that's something that you know that could be looked at for sure as a as a future direction uh we got to call up, you know, Anna and make it happen. <laughs> I mean, and on the other hand, you're also saying that, you know, the kids going through these procedures, kids, mm -hmm. um, is there an optimal age range, do you think, for something like the card system? Thinking of um, my own kids, age so four and seven. And I think, I mean, I think things kind of got halted given uh, COVID, but um, I know that the next steps with CARD was to test it in um, slightly different age groups. So uh, this was optimized for grade seven students, but I think um, there were steps to, it was in the works to try it with younger children as well, as well. And in addition to that, older children. So, um, you know, it could be that you know the the videos that we had prepared for the grade seven students they may not um, gel for younger or older students, but there's there's no reason that um, age appropriate um, material like educational materials can't be um, created for for younger and older students because these fears are definitely with you know, young kids and, you know, teens, you know, even young adults, uh, grown adults, everyone, so. Yeah, <laughs> some of us who could definitely use that uh, when we're going in for a flu vaccination. Um, yeah. I guess if I could just ask you then a bit, uh, keep going with the questions, um, about the coping strategies. So you mentioned a little bit about, you had some summary data of the coping strategies or some of the coping strategies that the participants used. Do you have any yeah. sense of whether participants changed their coping strategies between rounds? Um, so we did um, keep track of uh, like everything that they wrote down in round one, we, you know, reminded them in round two. And some kids said, oh, I, you know, I don't need to, you know, listen to music or I want to bring a different friend. Um, but we weren't meticulous about documenting that. I, that could be something, you know, in future to see, you know, do they want to use as many coping strategies the second time around? Um, with respect to my, my fidelity check, I was documenting, you know, what the, the child did use, um, for that 10% of, of, 
closely monitored interactions. Um, but I didn't go back and, and also it was, you know, different kids potentially. Um, so I, I didn't really see, oh, you know, they used 10 and then now they used five or, or whatever. But that's definitely an interesting point I, that, you know, it's worth looking well, into. Part of the reason why I asked is because it, to get some indication of which coping strategies seem to be most effective, at least in terms of the outcomes for um, fear ratings and willingness maybe yeah. to get vaccinated in the future. Um, do you have a sense for which of these coping strategies uh, are the most effective or that the participants seem to like the best? Sure. So I think um, it was pretty uh, universal that verb like verbal distraction um, is for sure uh, very popular. And, and that's something that vaccine nurses um, already or already do uh, for the most part in even in uh, as part of standard care procedures um, and in card schools too uh, having verbal distraction was very common um, but I will say that the unique um, interventions for cards such as having um, an, ex an external distraction device or um, having a friend or privacy, um, those were pretty um, commonly used as well. Um, so like you can, I'm going to just pull up uh, the number of kids here. Sorry. Whoops. Um, so yeah, um, there were, you know, a um, hundred and 30 something kids who got vaccinated in round one and um, like almost or more than half used a distraction device. Um, yes. So, um, and having a friend was, you know, al almost half the kids had a friend with them too. And um, so, yeah, I, I think those unique features were like well liked and well used by by the kids. Yeah, for sure. Um, again, if any of the uh, attendees have questions, feel free to um, just type them up there in the box. Uh, at the moment, I'm just going to keep asking questions though for a bit. That was fascinating. Okay, so uh, thanks for that offer, Rob. Why don't we see if there are any uh, questions in uh, the audience? Uh, I would encourage anybody to just simply type your question in the audience and I'm going to be turning it over to Annalise to uh, moderate. And so maybe we'll see if there are a couple of questions uh, that she has to pitch Tamlin or Rob's way. Annalise. Thanks, Owen, And uh, thanks, Rob. We do have one that's come in from online. So maybe I'll ask that and then we can maybe flip back to you if nothing else comes in. Um, this question is from Jim Bowen. Uh, first off, he says, thank you for the interesting presentation, Tamlin. And then his question is, did you measure the student's baseline pain, fear, and dizziness associated with prior vac vaccinations? Um, we did not measure a baseline pain, but pain, fear, dizziness, but um, we did ask the kids before they got their vaccine in the, in the card schools, um, if they like, how, like how ready were they, were they scared? Um, so, but I like that, that had to do with the day of not um, previous um, vaccinations, although um, some parents would, you know, when they were filling out their consent, would write, you know, this, this, you know, my child has a high fear, um, but nothing, you know, measured with, you know, stringent measures in place. Actually, Tamlin, could I ask a question as well? And it has to do with the notion of uh, parental proximity and the extent to which perhaps a vaccine hesitant or vaccine averse parent mm -hmm. may be telegraphing uh, to the child certain expectations around what, mm -hmm. what to anticipate with a vaccine. Was any of that a feature of your study? Um, and if it 
was like is there is there a way of sort of managing the parent who is present and either verbally or non verbally verbally perhaps amping up the anxiety of the child mm -hmm. in anticipation of uh, of the vaccine so from a vaccine hesitancy perspective um I firsthand did not really witness that and it didn't really like I didn't hear any kind of um, any any notion of that come up in like you know the Q and A session after the vaccine lesson. Um, there there wasn't really much talk of that per se with parents, but I did. Well, we we were working with the um, Catholic District School Board, and I think the biggest concern we saw coming out of that was specifically the HPV vaccine. There was some there were some notions of what having the HPV vaccine can do for children and, and with and was, respect that was more unique to that particular because that's a vaccine that's sort of in the in the area yeah. of sexual health it was more yeah. of that that concern rather than vaccinations per se yes right okay so there was a parent who came in to watch the nurses you know explicitly not give Gardasil um, okay yeah Interesting. Um, Rob, did you have a, a couple of other questions or reflections to share with uh, with the audience or with Tamlin? Um, yeah, I guess it's a question more related to uh, modifying fear, I suppose, as part of a memory um, once it's basically already established. So once, say, a participant or a person would already have a fear of vaccination. Um, and the reason why I ask this is that I guess in our own research, we do study um, we study pain, we study pathological pain and how we could actually modify that. And we borrowed ideas uh, for this from psychology related mm -hmm. to reconsolidation. And effectively what this um, process is, this process of reconsolidation, is it's enacted or initiated by recalling a memory. And yeah. essentially what happens is that memory trace itself, so you know we have this memory trace of everything we remember in the brain, essentially gets broken down and rebuilt sometimes during the process of recall. And if you can interfere with that process, mm -hmm. you can disrupt some aspects of that memory. So this has actually been used to try to reduce fear in PTSD uh, in human subjects. It's basically a process that's where consolidation has been observed more or less all species. Um, so my own perspective, I actually find this very interesting to think about different subcomponents of an actual memory in terms of how it uh, directs behavior later on. So if we take, for example, a patient going in for a vaccination who already has a very strong, let's say, fear of that um, vaccination, what strategies could you actually use then, not to just reduce anxiety at the time of it, but maybe to begin to dampen down that fear for, say, permanently or in long term? What's currently being used right now to try to address this? Well, what I can say is that um, I think for a lot of the kids that I, I witnessed, kids with extremely high fear, um, having like the nurses, you know, reflected on this as well. Um, having the kids have a positive experience kind of is like the, you know, it it breaks the the mold of you know what they anticipate and um all their their it, it kind of like breaks their belief system on having on on being afraid on having um you know an aversion to uh the pain or the needles themselves um and it was quite it's like interesting brief. A relearning in a sense yeah it was yeah like they would cut they would go in crying and then the nurse would like work while the nurses do you know blowing the bubbles or um you know the friends like you know with them and saying you're you're doing great you're fine um and like they're they're seeing that they can get through it once they they're on the other side of it they're like wait a second, that wasn't so bad. And then the next time they came back for their second vaccine in, in the spring, 
they, they were like, I'm ready. Like, I feel good. You know, it wasn't so bad last time. Um, so I think experience, um, I, from my, uh, from my experience, um, is a very powerful, um, you know, disruptor of, of, uh, previous, you know, associations with, with things. If, if you can mm -hmm. disprove what you, what you previously thought, I think that that's, that's really powerful. Um, Okay, well, let me turn it over to Annalise to see if there are any other questions from the audience. Annalise. Thanks, Subin. Um, We had a follow-up about Jim's first question about measuring students' baseline pain, fear, and dizziness. Um, his follow-up question was how many stated no issues um, with those? Um, that is, I, I do not recall offhand um this was data that um the nurses collected uh but because they weren't part of um my my research outcomes i did not uh follow that data so i i'm sure you know i could track it down and, and find out for you but i don't i don't know offhand unfortunately no any other audience questions um, we have one more. Um, this question, many pharmacists, this is very relevant to, uh, to right now, many pharmacists provide or pre-COVID used to provide vaccinations, although mainly for adults. And so the question is, any thoughts on how the card system could maybe be applied in community pharmacies or for community pharmacists? Hmm. Um, I mean, I think it, it's, I think the difference here is that with, you know, um, the school context, it's that familiar person who's like following this cohort of students so they, they can, you know, be accountable to the needs of um, what these children would like for, for their upcoming vaccination. And it's obviously different when, you know, a person comes in and says, hi, I'd like to, you know, get a flu shot or whatever. So, I, you know, I think, um, if there was community awareness, if this was, you know, widespread public health, you know, if public health disseminated these strategies for, um, you know, medical interventions, and then um, this way, the the person who's receiving care from a pharmacist um, is going in knowing, okay, what what strategies do I like what, what would work for me to help me feel calm? And then before that, you know, medical intervention, um, they can say, you know, I'm like, I'm gonna use my phone to just like keep my mind off the needle or what have you. Um, so, you know, if we empower um, people with, with these strategies um, to know that they can use them in any context really um i think i think that would that would be helpful for pharmacists and pharmacists i mean they may not necessarily use the card acronym but having that dialogue that conversation about is there anything that you know um, i can do for you to to make this a little less stress inducing or what have you okay That's so why don't we uh... Why don't we turn it over from back back to uh, Roberto Bonini to maybe ask one final question before we wind up for this afternoon. Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, a final question. I guess that long-term um, reducing fear of vaccinations is going to promote uh, more vac greater vaccine uptake. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have a sense, and it, I'm sure it's probably impossible at this point, but uh, do you have a sense of how this might actually impact perceptions of vaccines in general? So people do have a fear of the procedure, but there's also the fear to the vaccine itself. And you mentioned that a bit with the, the Gardasil for a number of different reasons. Mm -hmm. But, you know, people worry a lot about, you know, what's in the vaccines, what sort of risk of fact does it have? Do you think that this sort of an approach of just um, minimizing the fear of the procedure will also begin to impact their perception of vaccines in general? Um, sorry, minimizing in the sense. So by making the actual experience of vaccination 
less unpleasant. Oh, yes. It may have more downstream effects on the actual perception of vaccines in general. I think so. I think that, um, like, for for certain serums, they they're painful. Like, I think I think the HPV one hurts, if I recall correctly. Uh, it, it and a lot of people have um, like react strongly to that one. And so I think if you if you view the whole procedure as if you can. If you have, if you're armed with strategies to to feel calm about the whole experience, I think, you know, the overall takeaway it'll it'll just be more pleasant. The perception of the vaccine will be pleasant. Um, I think, yeah, the 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 fear and the pain are often like associated with everything else about vaccines. That I think, you know, the more you know, more positive thinking about everything will help you know, vaccines image overall. That's, yeah. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Tamlin and Rob. One maybe final reflection for me. I think it's uh, interesting that both of you uh, describe your childhood experiences or young adult experiences with vaccinations mm -hmm. uh, as being uh, less than positive, and yet both of you somehow managed to end up in this line of work. So perhaps, uh, past Tamlin and past Rob thanks future Tamlin and future Rob for uh, the work you're doing to make this a more positive and pleasant experience for uh, everybody that comes comes forward. Uh, before we wind up for today, just uh, a couple of uh, housekeeping comments. Today is our final CPE speaker series for, 20, for, for uh, the spring of 2020. We will be reconvening in October, for, so please stay tuned for our agenda and speakers and topics for the fall, and we look forward to seeing many of you online then. Before concluding for today, I want to have one very big thank you and shout out to Annalise and Conchita, who run all of the technology and do all of the behind the scenes work. You get to hear Annalise on these rounds, uh, reading some of the audience questions, but of course she does way more than that, and none of this would be possible without both Annalise and Conchita. So thank you very much for being uh, the operational heart and soul of the CPE speaker series. Thank you as well to Tamlin and to Rob for for their uh, very active and interesting uh, contributions to today's rounds. I hope everybody in the audience stays well, stays healthy. For those of you that are providing care to patients during these difficult times, thank you for your contributions and all the best to everyone for a healthy, safe and happy summer. We'll be signing off now. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thank you, David. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.